be running for President of the United States with the Green Party, the only party of, by, and for the people. That is what we are. We have been ahead of the curve in so many ways on climate change, on green energy, on demilitarization, on marriage equality, on free public higher education and canceling student debt, on stopping the Trans-Pacific Partnership, on ending the war on drugs and the incarceration state, on providing reparations for slavery and to the indigenous people of this nation, on, on opposing war crimes committed by Saudi Arabia in Yemen, and war crimes and war crimes and occupation committed by the Israeli government in Palestine. And so much more, we have been ahead of the curve for decades, and all of a sudden that curve is catching up to us big time. The issues for the Green Party and joining us here in our studios is Dr. Jill Stein, the Green Party nominee. Thank you for being with us. Great and Ajumu be Baraka, who is your running mate. Why did you select him as your running mate? Because he is a powerful and distinguished voice on behalf of human rights, on behalf of economic rights and workers' rights and racial justice. And in this country, we are in crisis really on all of those accounts. And it's very important that this election bring all of us to the table. And we really wanted to have a diversified ticket that speaks to so many disenfranchised American voters who are locked out of the economy, locked out of jobs, locked out of education, uh, and locked out of the dialogue in this election. So I'm really honored to have Ajamu uh, with me so that we can truly have a diverse, a multiracial, and a multicultural education to invite in the many people who are otherwise locked out of our economy and out of our political system. And we'll be talking about some of the issues that you're involved in, but let me begin with one of the key points of your platform. You said that you want to build a people's movement. You want to end unemployment and poverty. So on those two issues, how do you do that? Well, really one and the same. And we, in fact, incorporate a third crisis along with that. So unemployment, poverty, and climate change. We call for a, um, an emergency jobs program, in fact, that will address the economic crisis, but which will also address the climate crisis and to fix them together, because they can only be fixed together. Otherwise, people are really pitted against each other, uh, given a choice between either the climate or jobs. And that way people will always choose jobs because that's about survival today. Um, so we call for a jobs program to give everyone a good paying living wage job as part of this emergency green energy transition uh, to revive the economy, turn the tide on climate change, and which will also in fact make the wars for oil obsolete. So this is a win-win-win. And last point about this is that we get so much healthier by eliminating fossil fuels. There are 200,000 people who die every year in this country from the impacts of fossil fuels alone. So on that basis alone, we save so much money from eliminating fossil fuels that that health savings alone is enough to pay the cost of the green energy transition. And we call for zeroing out fossil fuels, creating all the uh, jobs in clean renewable energy, wind, water, and sun, uh, to basically create 20 million jobs, zeroing out fossil fuels Zero by 2030. By 2030. And you think that's realistic? Well, put it this way. Not doing that is not compatible with survival uh, from what the science tells us. And it says it in all kinds of ways, whether you look at Jim Hansen's recent study uh, that says we will be seeing double digits of feet of sea level rise as soon as 2060. Um, 
a recent report put out by Oil Change International last week said as much, that we've got to zero out fossil fuels in the next 17 years if we are going to avoid catastrophic climate change. So we have no choice. We say we've got to declare a national emergency, like we did when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Do you know how long it took for us to transform the economy? No one would have said that was realistic, but it was a matter of, of national emergency. It took us six months to completely transform the economy to a wartime footing. We have a new war now, the most deadly war we have ever faced, and that is the war for our survival against climate change. So if we could transform our economy in the Second World War in six months, we can do it in the next 15 years. Mr. Baraka, let me ask you about the cycle of poverty. And it is apparently, it's obviously very high in America's inner cities, and especially high among young African-American men. <coughs> and then you have the cycle <coughs> of poverty and crime. What is the role of the federal government? How do you end that cycle? Well, I think the government has a very important role to uh, play in terms of, of expanding um, justice uh, for making sure that um, uh, people have the ability to live dignified lives, uh, working with the private sector to ensure that people have jobs. And when you have jobs and jobs at a living wage, then you can uh, directly confront poverty. Uh, you can uh, create uh, conditions where people uh, will live in, in dignity. So uh, tackling uh, poverty, something that uh, uh, various uh, presidents have tried over the last few decades, is still uh, the number one uh, challenge. Uh, and to do that, you have to have an economy that is providing real justice uh, to people. And that means that you have to have uh, an economy that, that receives assistance from the federal government. because. This notion that the uh, private sector or the market, the magic of the market is going to solve uh, <coughs> these problems and going to create all the jobs that we need is, is uh, kind of naive. If you're a supporter of uh, Dr. Jill Stein and Nana Jama Buraka, our phone lines are open and the number specifically to call is 202-748-8920. If you're a supporter of Hillary Clinton, 202-748-8921 and 202-748-8922 if you're a supporter of Donald Trump. Are you where you thought you would be at this stage of the campaign? Um, you know, I didn't really have expectations about where this was going to go. Um, I'm extremely uh, gratified by the development so far. There has certainly been a media blackout that has held back our campaign. So we have received the least amount of primetime media coverage. In fact, uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton have had approximately 20,000 times more free primetime coverage on network news. Yet they are not 20,000 times ahead of us. Um, there is a strong grassroots campaign, especially among young people, millennials, who've been wiped out of jobs, who are mired in debt, and who are inheriting the climate crisis uh, full on their backs. And as they hear about us, they are absolutely overjoyed that we are the campaign that's actually paying attention, that offers a bailout for students, like Democrats and Republicans, they bailed out Wall Street, the crooks who crashed the economy. We're saying it's time to bail out the victims of that economy. That word has gotten out. The Sanders campaign, the uh, informed members of the Sanders campaign who've been able to get past this media blackout, they too are strongly supporting our campaign at this point. So it feels very exciting to me how we've been able to reach out to the African-American community, to the Latino community, who've learned that uh, the Republicans are the party of hate and fear mongering, but the Democrats are the party of deportation and detentions and night raids. So it feels like we're in a moment of discovery about the Green Party at the same time that people are, are more uh, fed up than ever, and the two Democratic and Republican candidates are the most disliked and untrusted presidential candidates in our history. We deserve open debates, and that's what the American people are clamoring for. And I think, you know, it's not over until it's over. We're still pushing for the right of American voters not only to vote, but also to know who they can vote for and what are the critical issues that really need to be discussed in this election. And your names appear on how many state ballots? I think we have uh, 48. 40, 48 at this point. 
Let me ask you about one foreign policy issue. You've been very critical of Hillary Clinton on Syria and ISIS and sh yes. saying that she bears a lot of the responsibility for what's happening there. How so? Well, there's no question, you know, that uh, ISIS has been a part of the major problem in Syria. And let's acknowledge Syria is a very complicated um, war going on. There's a civil war and there's a proxy war uh, among many foreign powers in Syria. It's also a war over who gets to run their pipeline through Syria. Uh, but part of that mess is ISIS, and ISIS in turn grew out of the chaos of Iraq, and ISIS also grew out of the chaos of Libya. And Hillary Clinton approved that war in Iraq, but she also led the charge into Libya. So she has everything to do, and her poor judgment has everything to do with the chaos around the Middle East now that we're seeing full force uh, in Syria. And what's really frightening now, Steve, to me, is that Hillary has been pushing for a long time, but all the stronger now. She's calling for a no-fly zone in Syria. And what that really means is not only bombing uh, Syria and taking out all of the anti-aircraft uh, positions, which means bombing population centers in Syria, but it also means shooting airplanes out of the sky who are violating the no-fly zone. That means we're going to war with Russia, we are both nuclear armed powers, and we have 2,000 nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert. This is extremely dangerous territory that Hillary Clinton is rushing headlong into. I'm going to ask you some of the same questions um, that were also asked in the first two presidential debates. And let me ask you specifically about the tax code and tax provisions. One of the questions from the participants at Washington University, Mr. Baraka, was whether or not you would change the tax system to ensure that wealthier Americans pay their fair share. How would you fix it, if at all? Uh, of course. I mean, we, we are uh, strong advocates in a, a tax system that is uh, truly uh, uh, progressive, one that is going to be geared toward ensuring that uh, the, the individuals who have more wealth are paying their fair share, that uh, uh, people who are working class people, poor people, that they have tax relief. We say that we're going to eliminate uh, taxes for uh, anyone, any individual making less than $25,000 and for families making uh, less than $50,000. So we want to see a tax code that uh, reflects the values, uh, the most progressive values of this country, one in which uh, the rich are able to and, uh, and are required to pay their fair share. It is really outrageous that we have uh, not only individuals but corporations that are able to uh, fully escape pay paying taxes here in this country. So, you know, the scandal of, of a uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, is only a scandal in that people are not aware of the fact that there are many, many more Donald Trumps in this system. We want to eliminate that and to make sure that we have the kind of revenue we need to address the, the, the social issues that need to be addressed here in this country. One of the leading topics in the last hour, and again, apparently in this hour, focusing on college education. This is from Austin, who has a question for you, Dr. Stein whether or not you can talk about your plan for college funding and also will this include housing, food, books, et cetera? So, uh, great question, Austin. So, um, two main planks to our platform on college education. One is that we need to end the debt. We need to end student debt right now, which is predatory debt. It's very hard to get out of it. And what sense does it make to throw an entire generation into debt uh, so that they can then have a shot at financial security. In the 21st century, you need to have a college education if you're going to survive in the 21st century economy. So in the same way that we provided free college, a free high school education in the 20th century, we need to now provide free college education in the 21st century. So going back, that means bailing out the students. We bailed out Wall Street, who crashed the economy with their waste, fraud, and abuse, so it's time to bail out the students. Bailing out Wall Street cost about $16 trillion. Bailing out young people in debt costs about $1.3 trillion. There are a variety of ways we can come up with that money. For example, we can tax Wall Street, speaking to the tax uh, justice system that Ajamu was uh, referring to. We call for a small sales tax on Wall Street. Taxing Wall Street transactions at a tiny percentage, like 0.2 or 0.3 percent would be enough to generate hundreds of billions of dollars per year, which could be used for that student bailout. And then finally, 
paying for uh, public higher education, remember this, it pays for itself. We know that from the GI Bill. For every dollar we put in, we get back $7 in return. So consider this an investment. And again, that money, uh, and it would be about $100 billion per year, that could come from, among other things, uh, scaling back on our bloated and dangerous military budget, which is uh, gobbling up more than 50% of our discretionary budget right now is going to these wars for oil that are not making us more safe, they're making us less safe. We have a lot of people who want to weigh in as well, but just spend 30 seconds, Ajamu Baraka will begin with you. Give our audience a sense of your background and why you entered this race. Well, I am a, um, a human rights activist, a human rights defender, <coughs> uh, an organizer. Uh, my entire life has been devoted toward uh, uh, trying to realize social justice, both in the U.S. and uh, globally. Um, I have um, a, a real desire to uh, serve the American people in a different capacity. I, I was honored that I was uh, asked to join Dr. Stein uh, in this quest. We believe in shifting power to the people and building real democracy. Dr. Stein. So, um, in brief, um, I'm a medical doctor and you could say now I'm practicing political medicine because it's the mother of all illnesses and we need to heal our sick political system so we can deal with all the other critical problems that are literally threatening our lives and survival and that includes poverty, climate change and war. Um, and then finally I'd say I'm a mother on fire and having seen that our younger generation currently does not have a future between climate change expanding war and this threat of um, nuclear weapons, Mikhail Gorbachev, the former head of the Soviet Union during the Cold War, said last week that we are now at a more dangerous point than we have ever been in history, that we are closer to nuclear war right now between the U.S. and Russia. Um, this to me is not acceptable. This is not something I as a mother can uh, sit back and watch. And my history is working with citizen groups, with ordinary people, so that we ourselves can um, improve re legislation and regulation in order to prove our lives, our health, and our economy. Let's go to Mary joining us from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, a supporter of this ticket. Good evening. Good evening. Um, first, I'd like to say um, thank you to Joe Stein for um, running for office. Um, between the choices that we have, I feel that um, you are in the best position to take our country to a higher standard. And um, my question is, um, what steps will you take in addressing police brutality and police reform in this country? Wonderful. Really critical question. And this is really at a crisis level. Um, and there is much that we can do about it. Uh, the crisis of police violence is really the tip of the iceberg of a crisis of systemic racism um, in our, you know, both in terms of jobs and higher unemployment among the African American community, uh, disparities in school and in education and in health and uh, indicators of health and uh, longevity and all of that. So this is a pervasive crisis. But to start with the police uh, violence, every community deserves a police review board and an independent investigator uh, that, so that every case of death at the hands of police can be investigated so that perpetrators can be held accountable. We need to transform the culture of policing so that it is not about confrontation and this broken windows policy of policing, but instead is focused on de-escalation and we move towards uh, a, a form of policing that is not uh, confrontational and based on uh, use of force and SWAT teams and recycling of uh, excess military equipment and so on. We need to uh, get back to a supportive form of community policing and spend less money on policing and more money on actually addressing the drivers of, um, of, of community uh, poverty, discontent, crime, uh, disenfranchised youth and ensure that we have good schools end the school to prison pipeline, end the high stakes testing actually, so that we're teaching to the whole student uh, for lifetime learning. So these are some of the many ways uh, we can begin to address this crisis 
of racism in our communities. Another foreign policy question dealing with North Korea. This is from Michael, who said she'd like to hear, he would like to hear what you feel about your plans regarding the increasing threat from North Korea. Great. So, um, number one, we actually need a peace treaty on the Korean Peninsula. Right now, you know, North Korea uh, feels very much uh, embattled and like they could be invaded at any moment. So you can kind of see why it is that North Korea is clinging to nuclear weapons. Uh, they feel uh, like they are extremely vulnerable. We need a peace treaty. We need to demilitarize the Korean Peninsula. Um, and then we need to begin to move forward um, through dialogue as opposed to be locking horns uh, in this confrontation that seems to provoke only more radical uh, behavior on the part of North Korea. And yes, we need to bring China in on this as well because China, uh, you know, likewise uh, is not happy with the extreme and erratic behavior of North Korea. But we need to adopt a policy of, uh, of engagement as opposed to threats and confrontation. When we've made progress with North Korea in the past, it's been through sitting down and having dialogue, not by having uh, military exercises on their border and flying planes uh, and sort of mock nuclear weapons drills uh, on their border. What is America's greatest threat? Well, you know, I think America has many threats right now. Um, among them, I certainly think climate change uh, cannot be dismissed. I think that is really the world's greatest threat right now. Um, in addition, America is very much at risk from these expanding wars uh, that are bankrupting us, that are taking more than half of our budget, and which also consume almost half of your income taxes now are going to these wars which are creating failed states, mass refugee migrations, and worse terrorist threats. So Mr. Baraka, same question I posed to Governor Johnson. What is the role of the U.S. military? What should it be? Well, it definitely should not be um, the role of, of just defending the 1% um, as the uh, uh, expression of the national interest. Uh, so we have to have a, uh, a foreign policy that really represents the, the best uh, uh, values and interests of all of us in this country. Uh, the military is in place to provide security. But what we, what we have seen with uh, foreign policy over the last 16 years has been uh, the military playing a role that has uh, resulted in uh, more insecurity for all Americans. So we have to shift the, uh, the, the, the direction of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, we have to make sure that we have a military that fits the needs of the current uh, period. We don't believe that a budget of over $600 billion, $600 billion is justifiable. Uh, so we have to shift our values uh, if we really want to have real national and international security. Let's go to David, who's joining us from Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, supporter of Hillary Clinton. We welcome you to the conversation. Good evening. David, go ahead, please. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Uh, Dr. Stein, you favor slavery reparations and other reparations. Um, some estimates for um, are reparations for slavery by itself run as high as a trillion dollars. Are you not worried that giving this much money away to um, one minority group would incense racial tensions? I'm asking this question as an African-American male. Great. Um, and it's a very important question, David. Um, there's currently legislation in Congress that would es establish a commission uh, to look at the various forms that reparations could take. Uh, and these are exactly the kinds of questions that need to be debated. But I think there is no question that this country was really built uh, on the blood, sweat, tears, and enslavement of an entire uh, race of people who were brought here for the purpose of building this country and building our economy. And let me also say that the consequences of slavery didn't simply end with the Emancipation Proclamation. Slavery evolved into lynchings, Jim Crow, uh, segregation, uh, the war on drugs, redlining of communities, uh, mass incarceration, and now police violence. Uh, and the disparities are unconscionable and not going away. In many ways, they've actually gotten worse uh, over the past uh, four to eight years. 
So I think it's really important. We've got to sit down. We need a national conversation about this. We're not only calling for reparations, we're also calling for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to address not only uh, bias and, uh, and racism based on, you know, or directed towards African Americans, but also, you know, racism towards Latinos, uh, racism towards uh, indigenous Americans that, um, and I should say indigenous people in general. So I think we need to face these issues head on. We need to acknowledge that there uh, is a debt to be repaid here and we need to uh, move forward through this um, uh, a reparations commission to study that issue in particular and through a truth and reconciliation commission that brings our art, our music, and our storytelling to bear so that we as a society can come to terms with this. There's an illusion out there that we are in a post-racial society right now, which we most definitely are not. We need to share who we are, what we're going through, and how do we come together as a community to go forward. But the other point in David's question, do you think that that would create another racial divide between blacks and whites and Hispanics in this country? And I think that's why you know we need to sit down and actually address this as a broader issue first. And that's the role of the um, reparations um, uh, inquiry. This is the bill that's currently sitting in Congress right now that would allow us to dialogue about exactly how this should be done. Uh, reparations, for example, should also be paid to indigenous Americans too. How do we sit down and look at the relative burdens, the debts that are owed here? And we also call for this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, so we can put it all on the table. This is not just about uh, bias and um, hatred against African Americans, but against our other disenfranchised groups as well. We need to put it all on the table, and then we need to get past it. We're at the midway point, but let me quickly bring you in on this issue. I think it's important for us to, to recognize that the, the process of, of repair is a process in which everyone impacted will have to be part of that process. Uh, and it is a process that will only come about as a consequence of the kind of, of fundamental change that we have to fight for. Uh, I don't believe, and we don't, we don't believe that we're going to have any process of repair um, in the current sort of configuration of power, that uh, this part process of reparations will come about as a consequence of a people's movement. And when that people's movement is successful, we have a process in place in which everyone who has been harmed, as we disentangle from this, 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 this history, as we uh, disconnect and put ourselves in a place where we can transform the society, then we have a process we can put in place in which everyone can address their long-standing historical uh, issues with the U.S. state and the U.S. experience. Let's turn to health care and as a physician yourself and two sons who are doctors or soon to be doctors. This is from James Anderson wondering how you would fix Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, and if you could be specific. Great. Yes. Yeah, so James, there is a wonderful fix. It's a fix that's been discovered by uh, every other uh, industrialized developed nation out there. Um, and basically that for us it would be an improved Medicare for all system. So we've already got Medicare. Uh, this means that we drop the age of eligibility down to actually uh, uh, before birth, during pregnancy, so that you are covered from cradle to grave, from head to toe, whether it's your health, your mental health care, your pharmaceuticals, uh, your reproductive health care, uh, your psychological care, it's all included and your care is between you and your physician and your physician is your choice so that you are no longer dictated to by an insurance company which is looking to shortchange you in order to maximize its profits. Right now 25 percent of your health care dollar is going into insurance, into bureaucracy, into paper pushing and waste. Instead under Medicare uh, it's about 2 percent rather than 25 percent that goes into overhead. That huge infusion of cash is what allows us to massively expand coverage so that everyone is covered for the same dollars that we're paying right now, but instead uh, every dollar goes into health care, not into health profiteering. Our conversation with Dr. Jill Stein, who is the Green Party nominee, and Ajamu Baraka, who is the vice presidential nominee. This is being streamed on our web at cspan.org and carried on C-SPAN Radio. Jim from Humble, Texas, supporter of Donald Trump. Good evening. 
Good evening. I have a question for Jill Stein. Do you think that the $20 trillion debt is a big problem? And if so, how would you decrease it? Great. Thank you for asking, Jim. Um, what we've learned over the past uh, decades, really, but especially in recent years, is that if you try to make severe cuts, like in government programs, so-called austerity, it only increases uh, the debt and the economies don't recover. The real way to recover, actually, is the way that we, we recovered from the Great Depression. Uh, even the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the Federal Reserve now have also come on board and issued reports saying that in order to get out of debt, the best way to do that is actually by investing in growing our economy. Uh, it's like in the Second World War. The way we grew out of that incredible debt was by actually investing in the economy, and we outgrew the debt. That's what we need to do now. That's what we're calling for in the Green New Deal, which is, like, is actually like an antidote. It's like the therapy for NAFTA, which sent our jobs overseas and closed our factories. Instead, we would be investing in American workers and in jobs and in creating the green economy, which is the technology and the installations, the energy, the food systems, public transit, you name it, all those things that create 20 million jobs uh, that allow us also to defeat climate change and to grow our way out of this debt. A question on Edward Snowden. This is from Kevin, Government Transparency. Would you pardon whistleblowers and encourage government transparency, and specifically with Mr. Snowden? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, whistleblowers are critical. They expose the um, uh, the doings inside of our government, they provide transparency that we should have. And in the case of Edward Snowden, he exposed how we were being spied on, all of us being spied on without justification and without a warrant, without a legal process. This was being done behind our backs. And in exposing this, he helped stimulate Congress to actually take action. It hasn't gone far enough. But it has begun. So I think uh, Edward Snowden is heroic for uh, exposing the violation of our basic constitutional rights. So we owe him uh, a debt of gratitude, and I would certainly pardon him and actually seek to bring him uh, into our administration to be able to advise on both keeping security at the same time that we respect our constitutional right to privacy. In the words of Benjamin Franklin, those who would do away with privacy in the name of security uh, will wind up losing them both. But critics will say he broke the law. Um, he broke the law, but for a very specific purpose, which was to expose the violation of our very constitutional rights. And I know that when people go into uh, service for government, they take a, a, vo a vow of loyalty. They take an oath of loyalty especially, you know, in the, um, in the security services. They take an oath of loyalty to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. So, yes, he broke laws, but in order to defend a higher law, which is the Constitution. And some people argue also, too, that uh, what he did should have been covered under the, the Whistleblower Act. Uh, but yet, instead, the uh, Obama administration chose to uh, throw the book at him. Uh, so this, is, this was a, a political decision. We believe you have to have individuals who have the, the, the courage to expose governmental uh, mischief. And that is is exactly what uh, Snowden did. But don't you worry that your view of government mischief may be very different from your view? And then you have these individuals who have been cleared as national security advisors, have this information, and they make the decision not following the law. Well, that's a determination that I think the American people need to make. I mean, did, uh, why should uh, Chelsea Manning uh, be sitting in prison for 35 years for exposing uh, clear uh, criminal behavior? So if the state is allowed to determine uh, who can expose information, uh, then, you know, we, we, have a, we have a real, real problem with democracy then. Let's move on to Steve, joining us from Oshkosh, Wisconsin, supporter of Hillary Clinton. Your question. Hi, I am uh, a, I'm actually very sympathetic with the Green Party and Jill Stein, but I must, uh, but I believe that it's, it would be irresponsible 
in this election to turn to um, be on the, to keep yourself on the ballot in battleground states where you may have the effect of turning the election over to Donald Trump, just as most uh, political scientists believe that Ralph Nader turned over the election in Florida. Hey, Steve, based on that point, stay on the line, because I want to follow up. You said that you want voters to invest their vote. So explain what that means, and then we'll follow up with you with your question, Steve. Yeah, so, you know, Steve, it's really important to look at where we're going. It's not just a moment in time, but where has this strategy of voting for the lesser evil taken us? All the reasons you were told to vote for the lesser evil over the last 10 or 12 years, because you didn't want the expanding wars, you didn't want the meltdown of the climate, you didn't want the offshoring of our jobs, or the attack on immigrants, or the massive bailouts for Wall Street. That's actually what we've gotten, you know, uh, by the droves, because we as public interest allowed ourselves to be silent and voted for the lesser evil. But the lesser evil doesn't solve the problem. Uh, the Obama administration, even with two houses of Congress, actually did all of these things that were, you know, as bad as George Bush in the case of climate, you know, blew the roof off of fossil fuel emissions. Yeah, all of the above gave us some renewable energy, but it completely uh, amplified and intensified fossil fuel production, which has been incredibly uh, destructive to the climate. Uh, the wars have gotten bigger. We're now bombing seven countries. You know, it's really important to look at not just the rhetoric here, but actually look at the track record. And the reality is the, the lesser evil and the greater evil is a race to the bottom. And even Donald Trump and the right-wing extremism grows out of the policies of the Clintons, in particular NAFTA, which sent our jobs overseas, and Wall Street deregulation, which blew nine million jobs uh, up into smoke. So that's what's creating this right-wing extremism. A vote for Hillary Clinton isn't going to fix it. And one last point, which is this, that it's now Hillary Clinton who wants to start an air war uh, with Russia over Syria by calling for a no-fly zone. We have 2,000 nuclear missiles on hair trigger alert, and Mikhail Gorbachev, the uh, former premier of the Soviet Union, is saying we are closer to a nuclear war than we have ever been. Under Hillary Clinton, we could slide into nuclear war very quickly from her declared policy in Syria. So I won't sleep well at night if Donald Trump is elected, but I sure won't sleep well at night if Hillary Clinton is elected. Fortunately, we have another choice other than these two candidates who are both promoting lethal policies. But on the issue of war and nuclear weapons and the potential for nuclear war, it's actually Hillary's policies, which are much scarier than Donald Trump, who does not want to go to war with Russia. He wants to seek modes of, uh, of working together, which is the route that we need to follow, not to go into confrontation and nuclear war with Russia. So let's go back to Steve in Wisconsin. Your quick follow-up. I just want to ask Jill to take her name, or if she will take her name off the ballot in battleground states so she doesn't turn it over to Donald Trump. Steve, are you okay with a nuclear war? I mean, how are you going to feel if we're going to nuclear war? Six months from now, we could be at a nuclear war uh, with Russia, thanks to Hillary's uh, foreign policy. We've seen what Hillary can do in Libya. Hillary says what she wants to do in, uh, in Syria. You know, it's important not to drink the Kool-Aid. Don't just be a victim of the propaganda. You really need to look at the track record here and then make a principled decision. Uh, if you decide that... Um, you know, that, that you don't want to vote for me, then don't vote for me. But voters have said they don't like those two candidates. These are the most disliked and untrusted candidates in our history. They don't want to be told to be good little boys and girls and keep voting for uh, these two parties that have thrown them under the bus. Uh, as as uh, Steve was mentioning, what we say is the biggest wasted vote is a vote for more of what is throwing you under the bus. Invest your vote in a true social movement for real change that will put people, planet, and peace over profit. I want to cover some of the same material that we did in our, in our first hour. We talked about the Supreme Court, the type of justices that you would put on the court. Who would they be? So what we need on the Supreme Court are justices who recognize that money is not speech and that corporations are not people who are willing to stand up not only to stop Citizens United, but to stop the drift that began even before Citizens United with other Supreme Court decisions that said, if you're rich, 
you get to buy out the political system. So we want really uh, Supreme Court justices who are on the side of people, not on the side of big money. Also justices that will stand up to defend immigrant rights, that will vigorously defend voter rights against voter ID laws and other efforts to disenfranchise voters and to take away our constitutional right to vote. Uh, and also uh, Supreme Court justices that support uh, women's rights and women's rights to choose as well as workers' rights. Is there a justice currently on the court that fits that model? Um, not in my opinion. Let me ask you about the issue of Black Lives Matter. I know yes. you've been involved in that effort. What would you say to those people that say all lives matter? Well, of course all lives matter. But the, the Black Lives Matter uh, um, demand is a, uh, a, a reflection of the fact that uh, in reality, black lives do not matter uh, here in the United States and, and really in most parts of the world. So the, the slogan and the movement uh, is an attempt to, uh, uh, to, to ensure that people understand that there will be a, a struggle to ensure that uh, black lives, in fact, do matter in reality. So uh, it's not saying that black lives matter more than anybody else, but it does say that uh, black people have value, uh, that uh, black people are not going to allow themselves to be uh, victimized by a, a powerful state that appears not to have uh, any concern for, for, their, for their lives. Uh, it says that there needs to be programs that will uh, reflect the fact that if the state says black lives matter, that uh, there will be it will be reflected in, in, in policies. Uh, it says that uh, it, for there to be real social justice here in this country, uh, that you have to have uh, a society in which uh, in, indeed, of uh, black lives and the value of black lives is reflected. Let's go to John, who is joining us from Westminster, Maryland, a supporter of Dr. Jill Stein. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Dr. Jill Stein, for uh, everything that you guys are doing. Thank I you. just have a question. What uh, specific strategies are you guys implementing to, uh, to battle the media blackout? It is uh, collusion from both sides and the media together to suppress, uh, you know, any third party uh, voice, let alone uh, someone as progressive and outspoken to power as you guys are. And uh, another follow up on that is what uh, other strategies can you recommend for your supporters to help spread your message? Great. Thank you so much, John. And on both counts regarding the media blackout and generally supporting our campaign, uh, please go to our website, jill2016.com or go to our social media, which is Dr. Jill Stein, and that's D-R Jill Stein, D-R no period, Jill Stein, and join the team. Um, in particular, join our campaign for open debates, uh, sign up as a volunteer, make a donation, whatever you can afford. 29 for Stein is uh, like the signature donation for Bernie Sanders, 27, that we've been getting a lot of. Um, join the team because uh, we're at a moment in history right now where the House of Cards politically really is falling down and people are looking for an option. I take it as really a great compliment that uh, the media is so afraid of us that they are working at great lengths to try to silence us. Um, and we, our campaign, above all others, you know, has really been shut out. 76% of Americans are clamoring for an open debate. There's one more debate to go. We're still going to push hard. Um, Democracy Now! yesterday featured uh, my responses to the debate questions. You can help let people know about that. You can view that on our website or on Democracy Now!'s website. So join the team. Uh, the wind is at our back and you know that 5% threshold, we're nearly 5% in many of the polls, which by the way do not tap millennials. Uh, they just tap likely voters, so we may in fact be running a good deal better than what the polls show. Um, but if you get to 5%, you have a whole lot of financial support as a legitimate party then, which would be a real game changer uh, and enable us to build. The other thing to remember is there are 43 million young people right now who are trapped in student loan debt. Our campaign is the only way out, and just by spreading the word among uh, young people who are holding student debt, uh, that is enough to actually win the election if that word gets out, because 43 million people in debt, that is a winning plurality of the vote. So get the word out, and we say reject the lesser evil, fight for the greater good, 
like our lives depend on it because they do. If elected, would you fly on Air Force One? Um, yes. And I mentioned that because it obviously uses a lot of fuel. Uh, yes, that's right. Um, but we would certainly be pushing for innovations in, um, in the air uh, flight industry to move towards uh, more sustainable uh, fuel uh, in air flight. We're not quite there yet. It'll take a good deal of research to get there. And certainly when, it, when there are other options, uh, we would do that. But if you're president, you, know, you, need to, uh, you need to travel, you need to be there uh, at the table, and I would certainly do that. But on the other hand, you know, there are many other uh, energy reductions that we would take, both in the White House, but as a matter of national policy as well. On the issue of climate and energy, is there one country that is a role model that you think the U.S. needs to emulate? Uh, you know, well, there are several. Germany, for example, thanks to the German Green Party. The Germ Germany just uh, adopted now the, um, the goal of phasing out um, uh, fossil fuel-based uh, automobiles by 2030. Um, they've been able to transition uh, much of their energy supply to uh, solar and to wind. Um, and I believe the Netherlands is doing very well as well. So simply by making it a priority and by having a Green Party that's actually part of government, they've been able to move forward. Dakota has this question. We asked the same question to Governor Johnson. Which individuals would you consider in your cabinet? And if you could be specific. So, for example, um, on uh, Secretary of State, um, we would certainly consider someone like Medea Benjamin, who is already a, um, uh, a, a world uh, traveler and an advocate for uh, just and peaceful relations with other countries. That is Medea Benjamin of Code Pink. Um, uh, there are a variety of distinguished economic advisors from Ellen Brown, who wrote The Web of Debt, uh, to uh, Richard Wolff, who is a renowned um, economist, to Jack Rasmus, who is a uh, labor economist that we would consider for, uh, for Secretary of the Treasury, uh, as well as for um, head of the Economic Council of Advisors, and for uh, chair of the Federal Reserve. Let's go to Juan, who's joining us from Flushing, New York, supporter of Donald Trump. Good evening. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to get your opinion on the federalization of police with the socially unjust killings. And also, uh, people have been skipping over this question. You as Jill Stein, have you ever been so far as you can to want to do more like? Thank you. Have a great day. One, we couldn't hear the second part, yeah. but uh, the militarization of police forces around the country, and this goes to an issue that we talked about with you earlier. I think is 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 a is one of the the biggest uh, uh, challenges we have, that uh, over the course of the last um, decade or so, we've had something like four billion dollars worth of military hardware uh, transferred from the federal government to uh, various police forces on the state and local level. The result has been this tremendous uh, militarization of the police forces. And along with that the hardware has been a shift in the attitudes uh, and the training of these, uh, of these military forces, these police forces. Uh, and we, we believe that has to stop, that there's no justification for that kind of hardware to be transferred to, to, uh, to local police forces uh, unless there is a, a, another uh, agenda. Um, the police are, are supposed to be in place to protect and serve. The question becomes, who are they protecting and who are they serving? Because it's clear that they're not serving and protecting uh, the vast majority of black and poor people here in this country. So we want to see a, a, a reversal of that process. We, uh, the courageous uh, organizers from Black Lives Matter uh, met with uh, President Obama and asked for uh, uh, the program, the 1033 program, to stop. Uh, that's the program they used to make those transfers. He refused. There were some modifications, but that program continues, along with the training of, of various police forces by uh, what we consider to be uh, repressive governments like uh, Israel. Let's go to Arenza, joining us from Anchorage, Alaska. Good evening. 
Uh, good evening. Um, first off, I want to thank you, um, Mrs. Stein and Mr. Baraka, for your efforts in the political spectrum to make things better. Um, and I have a question that's in two parts. Uh, one is directed towards C-SPAN, and one, of course, is directed to the Stein Baraka team. And that is this. Um, I would like to see a debate that would have all presidential candidates, but I would like to see Dr. Jill Stein's uh, comments, um, um, Dr. Baraka's comments as well, because um, I don't think the entire country is aware of the value-added interest of the information that you guys provide. Uh, I'm a staunch supporter of the Stein campaign. In fact, the Stein supporters may have known um, that there's a big movement here in Alaska that's going on. But I would like to see some type of debate between the major candidates and um, the Green Party, because obviously we are on the right track because we're doing everything correct. Now, the question that I have for you, Dr. Stein, is, is there a possibility that you can engage corporations to get them to realize that the rights of voters must be protected and they and they must work together with the community to allow them to place referendums and ballot initiatives um, before the voters on election day. Arenza, thank you for the call. Great, uh, those are all terrific questions. And you know, I wanna give props to uh, C-SPAN for, you know, for their uh, creating this time for the public to hear us. They did the same for Gary Johnson. They actually, I think they, I, attempted to bring us together in a debate, but weren't able to do that. Um, and I know, you know, the Democratic and Republican candidates uh, refused to debate us because they're, they're running scared. Um, in the first time that I ran for office running for governor in Massachusetts, I, we were able to fight our way into the debate because the, Amer the Massachusetts public was tearing its hair out having to listen to this you know, scam of a debate, the mockery of a debate. And we fought our way in to a televised debate, and I was actually um, a winner of that debate on an instant online viewer poll, at which point I was yanked out of the debate because it confirmed their fears that if the public hears what we're talking about, you know, I'm the only candidate for president that is not being funded by corporate money, by lobbyists, and doesn't have a super PAC. So our campaign is the only one, really, that has the liberty to stand up for everyday people because we're not controlled by uh, corporate America. That's why we are such a threat. That's why they won't let us into the debates um, and why they refuse to debate us. So the name of the game is that we have to stand up uh, and actually build our power. Corporations are not going to give it to us. You know, Their legal responsibility is to maximize their profit for their shareholders. That's what they do. When, when this country began, corporations uh, had to get charters. They still have to get charters, but they used to be dissolved. Those charters had a limited time span, and corporations, which get great financial advantages, uh, they had to justify what they were doing in the public interest. And if they failed to uh, improve public interest, then their charters were canceled, and their charters automatically terminated in any event. But now they've become these monsters of economic power. Uh, we have to organize ourselves. They're not going to hand it to us on a silver platter. We're the ones we've been waiting for, but as you pointed out, you're seeing it in Alaska. We're seeing it all over the country. We the people are getting organized. We're not going away, and I encourage you and others listening again to be a part of this people's revolution. Bernie showed us that you can do everything right, but you can't have a revolutionary campaign in a counter-revolutionary party like the Democratic Party. So join us at the Green Party and in this campaign at Jill2016.com. Thank you. And yet he is telling his supporters, Bernie Sanders, to vote for Hillary Clinton. He is indeed, but it's interesting that among the Bernie delegates, which are probably the most uh, informed of Bernie supporters, almost as many are now supporting our campaign as are supporting Hillary. It's about one-third, one-third, and one-third still undecided. A couple of minutes left. One more call. Rachel from Tennessee. Good evening. Hey, 
How are you? Um, I had some questions re uh, regarding the foreign policy, um, and it goes to uh, really uh, participation within our State Department and uh, in Congress and in the executive branch uh, exporting weapons to Saudi Arabia, who um, I'm sure you saw what happened on Saturday, um, uh, just atrocity um, bombings of a funeral. And, um, and I'm wondering, how, how would you tackle the, what I call the deep state? Um, yes. Because, I mean, it's also against the law for um, our government to uh, participate in any way um, uh, with terrorist groups. Uh, giving them weapons, and uh, and then also the drone program. They're uh, they're building a hundred million dollar or billion dollar drone base in Africa, and um, and I'm just wondering the um, how can these how can the people in Washington be held accountable for working uh, with terrorists. Uh, Rachel, I'll stop you great. there. We only have a minute or two left. Thank you for the call. Rachel, uh, really great question, and you've named a number of really critical issues. So, you know, um, this requires um, many steps in order to deal with, but the first step is for us to stand up and to have leadership, in fact, that uh, says we need a new way forward. We need a new chapter in foreign relations. We need a foreign policy based on international law, human rights, and diplomacy, not on uh, the exercise of brute military and economic domination. So we call for a foreign policy uh, in which we are not supplying weapons to people who are violating uh, international law and human rights. Uh, and that includes Saudi Arabia. It also includes uh, the government of Israel, which is violating human rights. We're supporting their army to the tune of $8 million a day. Uh, this would include uh, you know, Egypt, for example, which is also committing massive human rights violations. We need, with all humility, because we've been a big violator ourselves, of international law and human rights, like, for example, the drone program, which is an assassination program. That is a violation of international law. Uh, we need to inform our allies with all due humility that we're turning over a new chapter and we expect them to do the same. And in the Middle East, we call for a weapons embargo uh, to the whole region because we're basically supplying weapons to all sides and a freeze on the funding of all countries who continue to, a freeze on the funding and the bank accounts of the countries who continue to fund terrorism. And that includes Saudi Arabia, who Hillary Clinton herself identified as still the major funder of terrorist enterprises around the world. So there's a better way forward. We need to stand up and make it happen. And that's why I encourage people in this election, you know, we're not just deciding what kind of a world we will be, but whether we will have a world or not uh, going forward in terms of these endless expanding wars the climate crisis, the potential for uh, nuclear warfare, we need to stand up and do the right thing. And we can do that knowing that we actually have the numbers that we can win here, uh, including 25 million Latinos who've learned in this race that the Republicans are the party of hate and fear, but the Democrats are the party of deportation and detention. So we can me, stand up with the numbers we need. Ajamu Baraka, let me conclude with this question then. What is this election about in your mind? This election is about, um, about uh, uh, democracy. It's about uh, uh, shifting power back to the people. Uh, it's about building for the future. It's about having a vision of the future that says that we can be more than what we are today. It's, it's a, a campaign that says that uh, we have the, the ability to transform ourselves and our conditions, but we have to understand that we have that power and exercise it, and that allow uh, the fear mongers uh, to have us to, uh, to abandon our principles, uh, and to uh, support the, the, the lesser of two evils. This is about the future. Mr. Baraka, Dr. Stein, thank you both for being with us. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Great and a reminder, one month before the election, and C-SPAN continues to give you a front row seat to this presidential campaign, all part of our Road to the White House coverage, all of it available on our website at cspan.org. Thanks for joining us. C-SPAN created by America's cable television companies and brought to you as a public service by your cable or satellite provider. More Road to the White House coverage tonight on C-SPAN. Coming up, a conversation with Libertarian Party presidential candidate Gary Johnson. Then, in case you just missed it, Green Party candidate Jill Stein 
and her running mate, Ajamu Baraka. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were both on the campaign trail in Florida today. Mrs. Clinton held a rally with former Vice President Al Gore in Miami, and Mr. Trump was in Panama City Beach. That's later tonight. Watch C-SPAN's live coverage of the third debate between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump on Wednesday, October 19th. Our live debate preview from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas starts at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. The briefing for the debate studio audience is at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, and the 90-minute debate is at 9 p.m. Eastern. Stay with us following the debate for viewer reaction, including your calls, tweets, and Facebook postings. And watch the debate live or on demand using your desktop, phone, or tablet at cspan.org. Listen to live coverage of the debate on your phone with the free C-SPAN radio app. Download it from the App Store or Google Play. At WashingtonPost.com, this is the headline, Donald Trump declares war on the Republican Party four weeks before Election Day. Sean Sullivan is joining us on the phone from the Washington Post newsroom. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Steve. For Donald Trump today, once again, it's back to the tweets. What's he been saying? Well, he took to Twitter earlier today to unleash a barrage of attacks uh, against Paul Ryan, against John McCain, and really against any and all Republican elected officials who have backed away from him. Um, he said that Paul Ryan is a weak and ineffective leader who has been providing zero support for him. Uh, he insulted McCain. Uh, he called McCain foul-mouthed and said he begged him for his support. Uh, he basically signaled today that he is going to go all out against these Republican critics uh, at a time when usually parties band together and direct all of their energy at the opposing party's nominee. Uh, it's pretty clear that that's not going to be the case for the Republican Party and for Donald Trump during the final four weeks of this race. And so for all practical purposes, is it now the party of Trump more than ever? It's really two different parties. On the one hand, it is very much the party of Trump. He won record numbers of votes during the primary. He continues to draw thousands of people to his rallies. He continues to generate a lot of enthusiasm among voters, among grassroots activists, people in uh, some of these key swing states. But in Washington, a lot of that enthusiasm uh, has evaporated, and uh, there is a lot of antagonism toward Trump right now. So you're looking at a party that's really, really divided between a candidate that gets uh, you know, a lot of people jazzed up, but one who has alienated almost completely the power brokers, donors, and party leaders who uh, basically run the party in Washington. And in this conference call yesterday between House Speaker Paul Ryan and members of the House Republican Conference, it seems apparent based on what you and others have been reporting, a lot of frustration and even some anger towards the House Speaker on his decision. Yeah, anger and I think some surprise, too, that Ryan didn't more forcefully stand behind Donald Trump. There were some members who said, you know, that they, they, they wanted to see him get behind their nominee and that the idea of a Hillary Clinton presidency should be enough to make people support Donald Trump. But, of course, Paul Ryan has to protect his House majority, which for most of the cycle hasn't been in play. Uh, it may not still be in play, but if things keep getting worse for Donald Trump, the House might be in play. And so Ryan has to think about that. He's in a very, very difficult position right now. No matter what he says, there are going to be many members of the Republican Party that don't like his position. So whatever he would have said yesterday, people would have been angry about it. And we, and we saw that in the conference call that you talk about. Sean Sullivan, let me get your take on a question that so many have been asking really since Friday and Saturday. How do you distance yourself from Donald Trump, but not his supporters, not those who will go to the polls on November the 8th? It's a very difficult question, and I don't know that any Republican candidate has successfully figured out how to do that. When Paul Ryan disinvited Donald Trump from a rally in Wisconsin on Saturday, he got some pretty serious backlash. People showed up to the event. They protested him. They heckled him. We've seen protesters go to the RNC, and I would expect that we will see protesters go after some of these down-ballot Senate candidates um, that Republicans are trying to get across the finish line. So even when these Republicans are saying, look, my beef is with Donald Trump, my disagreement is with Donald Trump, and he's not going after Trump supporters, 
his supporters still take it as an insult to them. His supporters still take it as a slight to them that, look, we've been working so hard for so many months. We've been trying to get this guy elected, and, and for you guys to just pull out and essentially abandon him, that's an insult to us. That's an insult to the voter. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that we really need to watch in these final four weeks. How angry does this make a Trump voter? How angry does this make a Trump activist? And does it spur them to protest and perhaps even not vote for some of these down-ballot candidates? Uh, that's a really important question that I think will provide a lot of answers for what actually happens on November 8th. And isn't this really navigating uncharted waters? I mean, you'd have to go back to 1964, the nomination of Barry Goldwater, the last time there were such deep divisions within the Republican Party. And yet this seems even very different from 1964. Yeah, it's basically unprecedented in, in modern history. Uh, you go back a little more recently to 1996, an election where candidates did distance themselves for from uh, Bob Dole, who at the time, uh, you know, was basically, they had basically concluded that he wasn't going to win. But